Good morning. My name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors at Lincoln Glen Church. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. Today's going to look a little bit different, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, we're going to have a couple changes coming up for a few weeks. Uh, I'm going to take a, a few weeks off of preaching for a few reasons. And uh, The first is this. The first is that it's good for you. It's good for you to hear from some different voices, um, hear how God is speaking through other people. So it's good for you. The second is that this is a unique time where we can hear from some guest preachers that we normally wouldn't be able to, to get to hear from when we're meeting a person on a Sunday morning who couldn't make it to come join us here physically. So we're going to take advantage of that. We're going to uh, hear from uh, an amazing Bible professor down in Southern California. Uh, we're we're going to hear from a pastor in the Philippines in a few weeks. And so we have some guest speakers lined up that we normally wouldn't get to hear. So I'm really excited for you to get to hear those people. Uh, and then the third is this. I'm going to take this time where I'm not preaching for a few weeks and really uh, focus some extra intentional time, um, extra pr time in prayer, extra time reading God's Word, extra time reading uh, some other resources to really think about, pray about, reflect on what it looks like for us to be the church in this time when it's been so drastically changed by the, uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in in the midst of the pandemic. What does it mean to do ministry when we return together in person in a way that really reflects the time that we're in and speaking the, the gospel that does not change to a world that has changed. And so it looks different than it did in 2019. And so uh, spend some extra intentional time really wrestling uh, with the Lord about that and what it means for us to continue to, to be online and all of those kind of things. And part of that, yes, is uh, when we gather together in person, six feet apart, hand sanitizer, mask, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but bigger picture, what does it mean to share the, the ever uh, true, consistent word of God, the never changing gospel to a world that has changed? And so really praying about that. So uh, today we're going to have a few things that are a little bit different. So today is going to look different because we're going to hear some testimonies from uh, a few different people, four different people. Uh, maybe you've heard of some of them. Maybe you've never heard of any of them. But they are people who've had their lives radically changed by Jesus. And so I want you to hear how their lives have been changed by Jesus. Uh, and then reflect during this whole service about what is the story that Jesus is trying to write in your life. How is Jesus trying to change your life and how could you share that story to impact and bless other people? So as we have these stories spliced throughout this service today, that will be our sermon. I want you to really reflect on what is the story that Jesus is writing in you? Because we have a story that Jesus is writing called our lives and it fits in the larger story that is the story of Jesus that happens throughout human history and so where does our story fall in the grander story of Jesus so I hope that you are blessed and encouraged uh, by some of these stories that you're going to hear today people all around me all the time would say like oh you're such an amazing singer and that became my identity in a lot of ways was like I'm the singer When I was 12 years old, I ended up getting signed to a record label. I felt like I had the world promised to me. You're gonna make it, you're gonna be the next to this. I'm like, cool, yeah, just kind of going with the motions. But there were some things that happened within the label where someone else kind of came in and took over and didn't really believe in me the same way. I was just really confused of why they, they didn't see what I thought that I had, and that was it. I didn't have a record deal anymore. After that, every executive that I would talk to, there was always some reason why they didn't want to sign me. You're so reserved. You're too shy, quiet, loosen up a little bit. They wanted me to be this outgoing, bubbly personality, which I just, I didn't have. And that's when I really started comparing myself to other people. The thought came up to try out for American Idol. I made it pretty far, but ended up getting uh, sent home. This isn't just one door closing. This is like another door out of all these other doors that have closed in my face. And I was so devastated. I was the singer who, if I failed, then people would be disappointed. 
That's when I went back into my room, my childhood room, and um, I started to journal a lot. I wrote about confusion, feeling different, getting out these emotions I've never been really good at explaining. It was just kind of this messy book of just all my thoughts, and I would even write down prayers. Lord, like, guide me. I don't know who I am without singing. You know, if, if I'm not a singer, then if this doesn't work out, what am I, what am I gonna do? So to my 12-year-old self, I would tell that little girl who feels she's too shy or not bubbly enough or, you know, doesn't have the right look or not pretty enough or that your life is, is boring or that you have a boring personality, that that's just a lie and it's not true and you're being built up into the woman that God wants you to be. And it might, it might take a while, but one day you're gonna grow into your own skin and just be be the girl that God uniquely made as you. And you don't have to compare yourself to anybody. Those moments in my bedroom, when it was just me and my notebook, that's when I really got into songwriting more. I felt like I had something to say now. Um, instead of other people giving me words to say, now I finally had these emotions that I was carrying. I picked up the guitar, started to put my own original music out online, and it was this, this kind of slow building process that wasn't forced, there was no you know, you gotta be this and you, you gotta try this and you know, you gotta try to have this different personality. I didn't have to change myself, I could just be myself. And finally just saying, okay, God, you said you have a plan for my life, so I'm just gonna trust that. And even if it means that I don't get famous or anything, I'm just gonna surrender all of this to you, put it in your hands. And I think once I did that, that's really when doors started opening. I continued to put out different videos online, just original music, and next thing I knew, I was signed again to another record label and put out a full-length album, which I had never done. Daytime TV, morning shows, sold out tours, perform, and be nominated for a Grammy that still blows my mind and be the voice of an elephant in an animated movie called Sing. And that was just another dream come true. Philippians 3, verse seven and eight says, all these things I consider as loss compared to knowing Jesus Christ. I don't believe that every single day wholeheartedly but that I think is the goal, is to really look at my life and be like, okay, if all of this went away, would I still be okay with just Jesus and all of the things that he offers? And and I, I would say yes, I, I would be okay because he's just, he's everything. Through Christ, I can just be myself and just be surrounded by his love. I'm Tori Kelly, and I am second. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Savior has done.
done See how his love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great You've been faithful through every storm You'll be faithful forevermore You have done great things And I know you will do it again For your promises, yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable. Conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great. I can remember one particular moment that that I think really brought me to to, to a low point. We just finished winning, um, you know, a big game, big nationally televised game. Uh, I played well. Uh, the team had played well, and I can remember being out. Uh, celebrating afterwards. I can remember having some random guy, um, didn't know who he was, um, coming up to me and, and he basically said, man, Wayne, I, I wish I had your life. I remember as soon as he said that, it was, it was literally like I got punched in the face. On the inside, he really didn't know what was going on. He didn't really understand the, uh, the gravity and the magnitude of the unfulfillment that I had in my heart. It started out just as a young boy um, with a carefree attitude who was gifted with uh, some athletic ability and who just really enjoyed uh, to play sports just began to excel at, at basketball and you know that's when things kind of changed I began to receive some notoriety uh, because of, of my athletic ability to win some awards and uh, what was once uh, just something that I did for fun then turned into something that became a, a selfish ambition to receive you know more glory uh, from other people uh, and from the things that I could attain from it. 
And just as I began to excel and and to achieve my dreams, whether it was in terms of championships, in terms of uh, going to uh, the university that I'd always dreamed of, uh, playing at the University of Kansas, uh, winning conference championships there, and going to Final Fours, um, having a future in the NBA, um, having access to uh, drugs and alcohol and girls, basically, uh, during that time, I had everything that the world said should make you happy as a as a 20 year old college athlete. But yet, because I was so performance driven, because I was so worried about what other people thought about me and wanted to gain their approval, that at the first sign of of, um, of any conflict, any struggle, whether it was a loss, uh, whether it was a poor performance, whether it was an injury, uh, whether it was public ridicule in the papers or by fans, um, emotionally I would just be crushed. Just remember crying out to God for him to, to show me uh, someone or something. Lord, show me something that's truly worth giving my life to. A few weeks later, I would, I would run into some Christians. They shared with me the gospel in a dynamic way. They told me about Jesus Christ and the things that he had done with his life. They shared with me how he died for the forgiveness of my sins and that he had a purpose and a, and a plan for my life. And that's something that I'd never heard before. You know, that God had something for me to do here on earth. I gave my life to the Lord in July 12, 2003, and my life was completely transformed um, from the inside out. I had played for myself and played for the applause of the crowd for so long that I really had no idea how to compete outside of that, and God had to show me how to do that. He showed me that, that I could compete and that I could play for, for His glory that I could compete and play and live as, a, as an act of worship to Him for what He had done. And when that became the motivation of, of why I stepped on that court, um, that's where the freedom came, to where it didn't matter if I scored 30 points or if I didn't score any points at all, that if the posture of my heart, if the posture of of how I lived, if the motivation for why I did things was to glorify and honor God, uh, that I knew at the end of the day, He would be pleased with me. As that became the motivation of why I played, um, you know, those were the two best years of my career. I became an All-American, Big 12 Player of the Year, and, and um, because of the freedom that came from, from playing and competing for Jesus. When I first walked into the locker room, there was a, a lot of skepticism. They heard that I was a Christian, and their comments were, this won't last long. It was really intimidating. I can even remember a few of the guys you know, on the side literally taking cash money bets on me with how long it would take me to fall. You know, as time went on, as my rookie year uh, had passed, then I had um, you know, remained firm in my faith and began to have the opportunities to share with my teammates in the NBA locker room and how Jesus had transformed my life. That's when I began to start to feel their support. They began to pull for me. It was amazing the lesson that I learned from that. It's not necessarily the, the championship ring, celebrating the champagne in the locker room, parade uh, in the city, hoisting the championship trophy, but it was seeing how quickly that, that glory would fade. Moving on to the next year as the team struggled, swept out of the playoffs, and I can remember the Lord bringing a scripture verse to mind after that championship, First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 24, the man in all his glory, 
are like the flowers in the grass of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but it's only the word and the will of God that stands forever. Seeing how that eternal truth had matched up directly with the experience of winning that championship, um, it's really when the word of God and his will became something that I wanted to completely pursue. And it's really something that led me to, to step away from uh, professional basketball and to be a part of something that's not only going to influence and, and change my life, but have the influence to change the lives of so many people around me. And not just for a moment's time, but for eternity. It's a great feeling in knowing who you were made to be and to know what you were made to live for. My name is Wayne Simeon, and I am second. Now we're coming to the time in our service where we take our offering. And another way of, of viewing our offering is we are giving a part of us to the grander story of what God is doing in the world. And so this is a moment where we stop and reflect and say, I want to give this little bit that I am able to give from my story and give it to the grander story of what God is doing throughout his kingdom, throughout the world. And so that's a time for us to, to do that. And so you can, uh, you can write a check and mail it to the church, drop it off at the church. Our address is 2700 Books and Avenue, San Jose, California, 95125. Uh, you can go to our website, lincolnglen.org. And you can go to the upper right hand corner and click the give button. Uh, you can also set up a bill pay with your bank, whichever works best for you. But it's a way for us to say, I want to surrender part of my story and what God has blessed me with to the greater story of what he's doing in the world. And so we're going to pray for our offering right now. We're going to pray for what's going on in the world, the devastation uh, that happened in Beirut. We're filming this on a Wednesday, so maybe more has happened since then. But let's pray for uh, God to be at work through what we give and throughout what's happening in the world. Lord, we, we come to you and we are heartbroken to see the devastation uh, that has happened in Beirut. We pray that you would be at work uh, so powerfully there to calm people, that there would be uh, the right aid sent their way, that you would uh, use people all around the world to be a blessing to them in the midst of the loss that they are going through. Uh, we pray that uh, you would bring your love and the comfort that comes with Jesus to the people there. Lord, as we give uh, financially as an act of worship right now, Lord, help us to give from, from our story, from, from what you've given to us in our lives, to contribute to the grander story of you at work all throughout the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hear Savior, say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it. left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper spots and heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left
left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow And when before the throne I stand in Him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips I'll still repeat Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow He washed Raised in small towns, we moved a lot, had a, an interesting family life growing up. I got kicked out of kindergarten for arguing with the kindergarten teacher about a philosophical subject. <laughs> when I got a little bit older in middle school, it was nerd city, big thick glasses. It's like anybody, I want girls to like me, I want to be cool at school, I want, I want to be able to fit in, I don't want to have to worry about the way I look. I was born with nystagmus, which is more of a social problem for me. I can see okay now. It makes my eyes move back and forth and I have to compensate by moving my head to see. And it confuses a lot of people and it makes things awkward. It's just the way it has been for me as long as I've been around. And so it's made me not want to be seen. It forced me to figure out how to talk better. And I did a lot of reading. And here I am a communicator now on the radio where nobody gets to see me. I also have something called Asperger's syndrome, which is a very mild form of autism and it makes me uh, unable to pick up on normal social cues that people smile and wave and I don't, e I don't even notice or something. I'm in my own little world. I was just not socially confident. I'm a classic preacher's kid. Seeing my dad preach and discuss the Bible, and then coupled with the stuff we went through at home, was difficult to reconcile. And honestly, it made me extraordinarily skeptical about Christianity and whether I want to have anything to do with it. When I was 12, I decided I wanted to be a, a Christian because I didn't want to go to hell. That was my thought. And so I decided, okay, this is who I'm gonna be. Since then, honestly, it's been a lot less about hell than it has been about really actually growing in love for who Jesus is. What's striking to me though, as I look back, I think I started with some strikes against me, uh, with some physical limitations and some pain, and I encountered hypocrisy and was aware of who Jesus was and kind of wanted to run away intellectually from him. Uh, all the stuff I've been through, what's, what's funny about it is I can look back and not, there's not one thing that I can look back and say, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> there's not one thing in my life now. I'm drawing on all of it. And at the time I had no idea, no clue. And it, when you're going through something, uh, you don't know. You just think this is pain. It goes from why me uh, while you're going through it to uh, thank you, Lord. I've been married for 20 years and she's given me the confidence. She's a gift from God. She's given me the confidence to be in front of people. And um, she's made me feel like I'm worthwhile. Here I am, I'm, I'm a radio host, and it's like on across the country, and I don't miss the irony of that. <laughs> I know it's, I know it's, God has taken somebody who is so skeptical and socially awkward and put him in a place where he gets to speak for him, and I think it's because of my weaknesses, honestly, and I am aware of it every day. I go in and think, I'm speaking to maybe hundreds of thousands of people at any moment. And I'm very aware that I've been over my head. Uh, and there's no way, it's just like anybody else has a weakness. If God does something, if something happens to you like that, you know it wasn't because you're awesome. You know it was because he did something. 
I have to remind myself of that now if I go week through stuff, go, I, I don't know the end of the story. And the very stuff that I was mad at God for before is the stuff that I'm thanking Him for now. Um, that's pretty amazing to me. My name is Brant Hansen, and I am second.
Again, I, I hope that you've been blessed by uh, the stories that you are seeing of Jesus changing uh, people's life. We have one more story in just a minute. But uh, again, I wanted to share with you that Jesus is writing a story in your life. If you've been going to church uh, your whole life, Jesus is writing a story in your life. Uh, if you just started checking out church recently, Jesus is writing a story in your life. And so I want you to really pause and reflect on what is the story that Jesus is writing in your life? How is he trying to speak to you? How is he trying to teach you? How is he trying to change your life? We have a story and we call it a testimony in Christian circles, meaning uh, you, you are testifying to what Jesus has done in your life, how he's changed your life. What was your life, life before Jesus? How did Jesus get a hold of you and how has your life changed after you've come to know Jesus? And so really reflect on that. You may not have a story that you think is as dramatic as some of the stories that you've seen today. And that's okay. God saved you from some of that pain. But whatever the story is that Jesus is writing in your life, it's the story that he chose for you to write in your life. And so share that and bless that with people. So reflect on the story that Jesus is writing in you. I came across this verse that I, I wanted to share with, with all of you this, this morning. Uh, and so it, here it is from Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. For this reason also, since the day we have heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. And so I just wanted to, to share again from, from here 
Uh, we have not ceased to pray for you in the midst of everything that's going on, in the midst of missing each other, not meeting physically. We have not ceased to pray for you. And so I hope that you know that. We pray that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will as we've been talking about this series of finding God's direction for your life. We pray that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, so you can walk in the way that he calls you to live and that you be strengthened with power according to his glorious might, not in your own works, but in his glorious might for the attaining of steadfastness and patience, which is what we so desperately need in the midst of everything going on in our world, so that we can joyously give thanks to the Father who's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of life, that, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, God raised him from the dead, that we can share in this inheritance and share the story that Jesus has put at work in our life. And so that's, that's our hope and prayer for you, uh, that you would hear these stories and that you'd be changed by them and that you would realize that Jesus has changed you and you have a story to tell. So we're going to share one more testimony with you, and, and this is the end of our service right here. Uh, we've done everything else, but I, I, I say that because the, the story that we're going to share right now is a story of someone who uh, was in one of the towers on September 11th. Uh, spoiler alert, obviously he's around to tell his story. But I, 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 I want to warn you just as if you are a parent with, with small children, uh, what I would recommend for you is I would pause the service right now. We, we've had everything else. We've had all the songs, all the other stories. Uh, and right now would be a, probably a good time to pause the service uh, and then later uh, watch this story without the kids in, your, in the room and then see if it's something that you do want them to see or not. I, you know, it's a story about uh, being around, you know, in the towers on September 11th. So this may not be something that you want your kids to watch. I don't think it's something that my kids are going to watch. Uh, but it's a really powerful testimony. So I want you, if you decide not to watch it with your kids, at least for you uh, to see it. But just want to give you parents a, a warning for that. Uh, this is a really powerful story. Uh, and so uh, I hope that you are able to hear Jesus at work in the midst of this tragedy. So here we go. Yeah, I just have to duck for the... You ready? My life journey started in the city of Calcutta in the nation of India. <laughs> Thought my calling would be in business. So I ended up with a, a bachelor's in business, a, an MBA in business. I meet this young girl, fall in love, get married in January of 2000. And in February of 2001, I pack up my bags and leave Calcutta, India for a new life in America. I left home with two suitcases and $50 in my wallet. Land in New York City on a cold day. In a few weeks of getting to America, I find work on the 81st floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. My wife Mary, she finds work on the 71st floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Everything was now going so well for us. <laughs> and here rolled in September 2001. This is an exciting month. My wife is now about four months pregnant with our first child. But I happened to also pick up this book called The Prayer of Jabez, that first week of September. And that book really got me thinking. And I started asking these questions. God, what is my purpose of having moved to America? Is it all about the success and fame that I can find in this country? Or is there something more? It is the most beautiful, clear day on the East Coast. I'm on the 81st floor of the North Tower. I sent out an email to someone that would go to my church saying, something's happening to me this morning. I know there's a call of God upon my life. I've just been chasing stuff in America. I want to be used of God. It's 8 or 5 in the morning, and I hit the send button on my email. I'm standing by this fax machine, trying to send some documents out to our office in Philadelphia. And I hear this incredible explosion. And now come crash. 
crashing into our tower. What followed was the buildings are shaking violently. Walls begin to cave down. I started seeing things fall all around us. Jet fuel by then had made its way down onto our floor. Fire breaks out all around us. So we start fighting our way through the fire, make our way onto that stairwell. Thousands of people now joining us onto that stairwell. The fear of death written on the face of everyone. We hear an explosion. This is the second plane crashing into the second tower. I'm trying to reach my wife. I'm trying to reach her through my cell phone. I borrow the phones of all the people that are with me, but cell phones just wouldn't work. And I'm saying, God, if this building is gonna go down with us, I'm never gonna see my wife again. I'm never gonna see the child she's carrying. I get to this level, which is called the plaza, but now this place of life, this place of just exuberance where life would be celebrated has now been turned into a place of death, a place of destruction as I see hundreds of bodies of people that jumped out of the buildings, people who were in those planes. I start walking towards the South Tower, had no idea about what was about to happen. 15, 20 feet away from this building, when I suddenly realized that the ground that I'm standing on, the ground around me is shaking. I felt like I was being sucked into some kind of vacuum that was being created around me. I hear another incredible roar, thought it was a bomb, but this is not a bomb. The building and approach, the South Tower, was finally imploding and going down. I was about nine years of age. I watched my only sister die to leukemia and it did not make sense to me. If there is a loving God, if there is a God who is interested and involved in the affairs of men, then why is there death? Why is there suffering? I looked around and there's 15 or 20 people around me. And by then we had huddled together. And now this thought comes to my mind. These people that are with you, where are they going without Jesus? And till that moment in my life, uh, I was a closet Christian. I would never be very vocal or verbal about my faith. But facing death, I feel this boldness to speak up for Jesus. And I started crying out Jesus, and I asked those 15, 20 people to call upon the name of the Lord. The most incredible thing happens. No, not one try to argue with me or debate with me. But as I started calling upon the name of the Lord, they followed in unison, and I could hear these people cry Jesus with me for a few minutes. After about 20 minutes, I'm surprised that I'm still alive. I'm plastered with soot and glass. I could not breathe. The soot and the ash was getting into my lungs. I decided to crawl, feel my way back to that place where I had prayed with those people, to only realize that these people who had just prayed with me, they did not make it out alive. Their bodies were smashed and crushed. I said, God, they just call upon your name and how come they not make it? But I felt the Lord saying, Sujo, they made their peace with me in their dying moments and they're resting with me in my presence. And now something amazing happens. A red light begins to flash to the soot and to the smoke. The light now leads us out of the pit and I'm trying to run out of ground zero. When suddenly another roar, I turn back and this is the North Tower collapsing. I'm out of the debris. By now the towers have collapsed. Both of them have collapsed. Dust, smoke, ash, balls of fire rising out of ground zero. And I'm sitting right in the middle of one of the streets of New York City, wondering, God, why did you spare my life? For sure, my wife is dead. I had now given up hope about my pregnant wife. I felt impressed I should walk into a store that was right across to me. A young girl from the store comes out, pulls me in. She started removing glass from my hair, and she says, let me call your family for you. I told her what I thought had happened to my wife. 
She takes my cell phone. And as she's trying to pull some numbers out of my cell phone, my cell phone rings for the very first time that day in that girl's hand. She has me back the phone. I flip my phone, I see my wife's caller ID. And I'm thinking it's someone else calling me with the news that your wife is dead. So I picked up the call with a lot of fear, thinking that would be the worst news of my life. But when I said hello, it's my wife on the other side. Her life was spared. She tells me what happened to her. She wanted to go to work early that day, but that morning she was late to work. And now we meet each other late that day. It was the most amazing moment. From just sheer fear that each of us thought the other was dead, now finally reunited. That night I said, God, I am done chasing the things that's been on my heart. I've been chasing success, fame, financial security. But from now on, I want to be chasing that which is in your heart. And I'm convinced that all that's in your heart is people people from all of the world, many of them who have never heard your name even once. So God, I want to be a proclaimer of the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to redeem my time. So God, here's a surrendered life. Would you rewrite the story of my life? My name is Sujo John, and I am second. <laughs>